Hi, my name is Mike Cassidy. My wife Nancy and I have been members for about 15 years. We enjoy being greeters at the first service and we look forward when we can all meet again together. Today our scripture passage is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth for you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, uh, friends, brothers, and sisters of Canyon Creek. It is good to be here with you this morning and to bring the good news of the gospel to you. It's been a disheartening week. Uh, I think it would be difficult for any one of us to look at the events at our nation's capital and not be disheartened. We are called as Christians to be conscientious citizens to pay attention to what's happening in our country, to at the very least pray for it, pray for our country's leaders, and then move to action in whatever way, big or small, that God would call us to act, to, you know, to vote, to pay our taxes, to be involved in the process. And so this week is disheartening. It's disheartening, I think, for all of us. And I can't think of a better place for us to be than right here, right now, worshiping God and bringing these things to him. Furthermore, by God's providence, I am so excited that we are starting this brand new series in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this series is called The Hope-Filled Church. I think what a great thing for us to focus on as we head into the new year if you had placed some inordinate amount of hope in 2021 in some way in which it was going to overcome 2020, uh, I think it's time to walk away from that. As, as Christians, our hope is not found in a year. It's not found in a government. It's, it's found in the hope of the gospel, the hope of the work of Jesus Christ. Now, in this title, I believe we are looking at two churches. One is the hope that is found 
through the church in Thessalonica. But I also believe it's the hope found in Canyon Creek. And I believe after the events of this past week, we certainly need to hear about churches that are saturated in God's Word, presenting the gospel clearly, and in the manner in which God presents himself, not the way in which God, man wants to present God. It was wonderful these last two weeks to listen to two young future pastors preach and teach from God's word with excellence. To see how God has shaped them and their response to that call. I am filled with hope for the long-term future of God's word being preached in young men like this. It fills me with hope to see the faithful men and women of Canyon Creek do the work of under-shepherd to step forward and, and continue to lead life groups, to continue to do the different ministries of the church. It's been an honor, a joy, and a privilege just to sit in on the Sunday school classes and see our adults stand up and lead our youth to take the gifts that God has given and humbly serve. It's a joy to be in a church where I see the Holy Spirit moving in the staff and the elders and the congregation to continually respond in faith, love, and hope in the San Ramon Valley. The Thessalonian church was also bold in their faith, love, and hope. We can read their story in Acts 17. Paul came across the synagogue in Thessalonica after leaving a volatile ministry in Philippi. He was allowed to teach in this synagogue, and many came to believe. Not just Jews in this synagogue, but Gentiles as well. Essentially, many people from many cultures and many backgrounds. They provided hope to their city, even amidst their persecution and suffering. And then according to Acts 17.5, some who were jealous of Paul's work, just a, few, a couple months into it, a few weeks into it, they, they, they began an uprising against Paul and Silas. And so aggressive was this uprising that they were run out of town. And not only were they run out of Thessalonica, but they would be run out of other surrounding cities too. I love how Luke, in the book of Acts, in verse 17.6, uh, six, uh, captures what these men did. It says this, it says, these men turned the world upside down. I love that. These men turned the world upside down. Now, I've been doing a great deal of thinking about how, how, how God has turned the church upside down in 2020. Although there are many difficulties and challenges, I believe there have been many ways in which God has turned our world upside down in a good way, in a way that benefits us. I believe God is slowing us down so we can examine our work and our life and our faith balance. I believe God is showing us how we can, can, can reinvest time, energy, and, and strength in our families, in our relationship with children and spouses, older parents, and building and solidifying those relationships. I believe God is slowing us down to examine our use of time and treasure and talent. More than this, God is slowing us down so we can see with fresh eyes how he's working in our life day by day. I believe he's calling us back to his word. I believe he is calling us back to prayer. I believe he is calling us back to himself and to truly be in awe of his presence, which is with the believer every day. It's time for all of us, perhaps, to have our worlds turned upside down. I believe I see God at work in Canyon Creek. Are you listening to it? Are you hearing it? Are you seeing it? See, the church in Thessalonica was ready. They were ready for the wake-up call from the Lord. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica a couple of years after their formation as a church. And so we see the Acts, the events in Acts 17, and now it's a couple years later, and Paul has written this letter. And so it's roughly written about 50, 51 AD, so about 20 or so years after uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross and was, was resurrected. 
He wrote to them. Paul's purpose in writing to them was twofold. One, he had a great thankfulness for them. As he saw them step out in faith, hope, and love, he was was genuinely thankful for how God was working in this young church. But he also wanted to, 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 to push them forward to grow. He wanted to challenge them as they would move forward as a church to not grow stagnant. Paul was filled with hope in the work of the church because he saw how God was working in them. And so, here is the introduction to this letter. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ. This introduction is fairly standard for Paul's letters. Uh, He ends up writing 14 letters, nine of them specifically to churches, 10 if you count Philemon, which I would. Paul captures the gospel in his salutation with two simple words, that he sends grace and peace. The gospel is simply the good news that the Father and the Son have worked together to bring out our salvation, that God the Father in his infinite wisdom planned for his son to die on the cross to rescue us from our sin. Therefore, we are, 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 get, are forgiven by his grace, a free gift of, of life from death, but not only grace. The gospel teaches that we also receive the peace of God. We are brought into his presence And his presence remains with us. We are eternally present with him as he is eternally present with us. The unfolding of the gospel is that we will become more and more alive in his presence. This belief and understanding fueled the church in Thessalonica much like it it fuels Canyon Creek today. The church in Thessalonica clung to the gospel in order to steer through their difficult times and their trials And this filled Paul with thankfulness. Paul was thankful for three gifts that he saw established and working in this church. Faith, love, and hope. And so before we get to these gifts, let's let's finish by looking at two ways in which Paul identifies the, the, the the church in Thessalonia. First, he recognizes their ministry field. They are called to work and minister in Thessalonica. This is a city of of roughly 200,000 people filled with a majority that know nothing about Jesus. And they are called to be light to this community and the surrounding communities. And we have a similar situation. We are called here to the San Ramon Valley. You're called to the San Ramon Valley. There are hundreds of thousands of people here who know nothing about Jesus. Or what they do know about Jesus is off. They are our specific mission field, Canyon Creek. Second, he recognizes they are united by God the Father and God the Son. Remember, the gospel is not only about our rescue from sin to avoid hell, but it is also about the joy of learning what it means to abide in the Father and to abide in the Son. The foundation of the Christian faith is recognizing God as Father and getting to know Him personally as Dad. It's, it's, it's knowing God the Son and getting to know him as our friend and our brother. And God the Holy Spirit. And, and you may ask yourself, why is the Holy Spirit not specifically mentioned? Well, the Holy Spirit is most often represented in the work he is doing within the body of the church. The Holy, Sp- the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the life of the church body. And the work they are doing, ministering the gospel. In one sense, you could say he mentions the Holy Spirit the most all throughout the letter as the Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of individual men and women. And so moving on to verse 3, we see an introduction to the first half of the letter. Paul is thankful for the church in Thessalonica. He's going to express his thankfulness over the course of these first three chapters. And then the second half, he will push them towards their growth. The first area in which he is thankful is the work that he sees that Jesus has done in the life of this young church and their response to that. 
And the three gifts that Jesus has bestowed upon them are faith, hope, and love. And then Paul expands on these three gifts in verses 4 through 10. He fleshes out the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. Each gift has two components to it. The work of the Father of the Son and the response of the people of God, the church. And so we're going to look at each one of these, what God does and what he brings, and then the response of the people on each one of these gifts. And you might ask yourself at this point, why is it important we see these things? Why does it matter? Well, friends, I believe God is ready to do a great work in your life. But I also believe sin clouds our vision from seeing it and taking actions. And it's letters like this and sermons like this that are an attempt to clear out what's blocking you from going forward to to fully receive what Jesus offers you, faith, hope, and love, and then to respond to it, to boldly respond to it. That's what we'll see in the church in Thessalonica, and I pray it is what we will continue to push ourselves towards as a church. As we move to verses 4 and 5, we learn about how God works out our faith into us. And then in verse 9, we will see the response of that work. Okay, so we're going to look at 4 and 5, then we're going to skip to 9. So first, uh, faith begins with the work of God. Faith is a gift. It is a free gift given to you by God. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it teaches that Jesus is the author and perfecter of that gift, your faith. And what does it mean to be the author of something? Well, before an author writes a single word on the page, there is nothing. It takes the author to create something on the page before you have a book. Jesus is the one who wrote on your heart first. He wrote himself into your life. He wrote his story into you. His gospel story comes to you as a word, a word written on a dark heart, a a, a word written on a fractured heart and a broken heart. And he writes that word on your dark heart and the darkness begins to disappear and fade away and a light shows up and it begins to grow and be revealed. The light begins to shine and life is given. And we see this in stories. We see it in the conversions of the, of the disciples as Jesus ministers to each one of them. We see it in people like Nicodemus in chapter 3 who, who, who have a darkened heart and as, as God is talking to him about being reborn and God is talking to him about the movement of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you see that light beginning to shine. When those first few words are written, there is nothing quite like it. To see someone who has lived in the fog for a long time and to see how the Holy Spirit just sort of blows that darkness away like dusting off the rust and and you see life in somebody as Jesus writes his faith story into you his his, his spirit comes in power and you can you can see that in people's life that first moment where God God's presence is is real to them and the excitement and energy from that. And notice in verse 5, it says that the gospel does not only come in word, right? It comes by power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when you receive the gospel, you receive a new work of faith being written by Jesus into you. And you have the opportunity to respond. Faith is worked out in us when we respond to the work of faith of Christ. And you see, your faith grows in accepting the influence of that work that Christ is doing in you. Accepting the influence of God on your heart and your mind. And it states in verse 5 that the Holy Spirit entering the life of a new believer fills them with conviction. They were no longer going to be the same, but they were ready to, to receive the influence of the Holy Spirit on their lives. This is what Paul saw in the church in Thessalonica, people who were ready to receive the accepting influence of the Holy Spirit in their life and respond. Now, John Gottman, in his book, The Seven Principles That Make a Marriage Work, states that if you get to a place where you cannot accept influence from your spouse, your marriage is over. And I might even just transcend that even to any friendship. Like if, if you aren't in that place where you can accept influence. 
there will be a contempt that will grow in your relationship that will ultimately destroy it. When you say to yourself that there is nothing your spouse can do to transform you, change you, grow you, when you're not influencing each other, then there's really nothing significant happening in that relationship. And contempt slowly begins to grow. And it destroys the relationship and ultimately could end it. The exact same thing happens with Christ. When you come to his word, you come, do you come ready to change? Ready to do the work of faith? Or do you simply want to fight with God and contend with him and perhaps change his mind? Hey God, maybe you don't have it right. Culture seems to be sending a new message. And I think you should sort of shape and shift to culture. See, that's not being convicted by God's word. Many today want to bend the Bible's meaning to fit their narrative. They will walk away from interpreting God's word the way that he intended and and, and instead recreate God's voice in their own image. And this is contempt for God's word. This is a form of idol worship. This is the opposite of accepting the influence of God's work in your life and the word that he's writing on it. And now skipping to verse 9, we see the Thessalonians rejected following that path and gave themselves over to the Lord. They received his influence on their life. They stopped resisting. Now this is the practical steps. The Thessalonians began to put away their idols. As faith worked through them, the balance shifted. Their priorities shifted. What became the most important things to them before Christ now became less. Life was no longer about pleasing themselves and gratifying themselves, but about giving glory and honor and praise to the Lord. The weight and focus of their priority shifted away from the carnal things and the worldly things to gospel things, gospel truths. And friends, this is, this is when a church becomes alive, is when that shift happens. When corporately idols are put away and instead Christ is made much of. And this is what gets a pastor fired up, is seeing moments and, and movements within their church in which the gospel is taking over, the work of faith is taking over. If we are going to have a working faith, then we need to look at the idols of our heart and shift the focus away from them and towards the Lord. That's my hope for this series for us, that we will do the work that we need to do to focus our attention on Christ and his gospel message. And so this brings me to the second point, the second gift given, love, the labor of love. All right, the labor of love displayed by the Thessalonians flows out of the love, again, shown to them first by the Lord. And so first we will see how the Lord revealed his love and then their dynamic response to that love. And so now we're kind of in verses 6, 7, and 8. According to Paul in verse 6, they were limiting the love shown to them. They were imitating, sorry, they were imitating the love shown to them. Paul isn't saying they were imitating him as much as they were imitating Christ. He clarified this in, in many other letters. In 1 Corinthians 11, once he said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so if you see something that I'm doing that is like Christ, follow it, imitate it. If you see something that I'm not doing that isn't like Christ, ignore it, throw it away. Now, we love God only because he loved us first. 1 John 4, 10 and 11 says it this way. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So notice that they recognize this love in the midst of their trials, not after their trials are over. The Thessalonians recognize that God is at work in this moment, changing hearts in the midst of the trial, not after the trial. And what gave them this power? And the answer is simple. According to Scripture, Jesus went first. He set the example to imitate. Jesus went through trials and pressures and temptation, hardships and afflictions. He wept, he laughed, he he persevered, he healed, he rebuked, he empowered and he made great promises. He offered his life, was resurrected and now sits at the right hand 
of God extending his love to us. And so in 7 and 8, it says the Thessalonians responded by loving the people in their cities, both Jews who were persecuting them and Gentiles. Their love became so well known that not only was Thessalonica changed and filled with the gospel message, but the surrounding cities of Macedonia and Achaia as well. Paul literally says by the end of verse 8 that he stopped preaching the gospel because people were preaching it to him. Now, I just love that image of someone walking up to Paul, not knowing who Paul is, and saying, hey, Paul, do you know Jesus? Have you heard about this person, Jesus? And I mean, just the smile inside of Paul's, you know, heart in that moment, God's blessing him in that, that people are talking about the work and love of Christ. Now, this, again, is my hope for us as Canyon Creek. And this is really the hope of any pastor, I would hope, that we would be known as a church that loved God because of the great love he has shown us. And that we were a congregation that was always in season to teach the word of God that we would be a witness of love to the Tri-Valley. And the message we have to bring is the steadfastness of the hope of the gospel. So let's turn to verse 10 in our final point. In verse 10, we see this summary of the enduring hope of the gospel. And the enduring hope of the gospel is, is being willing to see how God is faithful to his covenant promises, that he works on our behalf in love, And in verse 10, we see the Thessalonians cling to the promises that Jesus will deliver them from the wrath of God. They are firmly convinced that he has done the work on their behalf. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Thessalonian believers recognized that sin had no claim on them, and Jesus would deliver them. This gave them the bravery to face whatever persecution they would face with a steadfast hope that relied on God being faithful to his promises. They placed their hope in three things. First, they believed Jesus was was in heaven sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament like Psalm 110, which pointed to Jesus. Second, they believed Jesus was raised from the dead. That he died on the cross, yes, and then three days later he rose from the grave. He defeated death on the cross and was given authority over the living and the dead. And then third, they believed he would deliver them. They placed their hope that not only was Jesus resurrecting himself, but he was resurrecting them. And this is what we're inviting people into, friends, is this understanding of our hope. Our hope that Jesus is going to do the work that he promises that he will do. That Jesus will deliver on his promises faithfully. That Jesus is in a place that we do not understand and that we do not know, but we know is a place of of beauty, wonder, and awe. C.S. Lewis termed it a a distant country, a faraway land. And that in this lifetime, we're wrestling, trying to figure out what will that place be like? What is a world without the destructive power of sin in it look like? And we don't know. It's too far away. It's too distant. But in this world and in this time, we know that we have a Lord and Savior who is doing the work for us to bring us to that place, but also bring healing here through you and through me as ambassadors of the gospel. And this is our job. This is our work. This is what he has us primed to do. And so as difficult as it might seem right now, let us recognize our call to be ambassadors of hope and to be a church that is a lighthouse of hope. And so as we continue in this letter, we're going to see the brave witness of the church in Thessalonica and then challenge ourselves to be the same brave witness as well. And so this first half of the letter is going to continue to focus on the thankfulness that that Paul has for the church in Thessalonica. Uh, Paul celebrates here in these 10 verses uh, the work of faith, love, and hope for two reasons. He sees the work of the Lord, and the response of his people. This in turn sets an example for us as we seek to grow in a similar way. So friends, let us begin to see how Jesus is working on our hearts and let us get to that place where we faithfully respond to it. Let's pray. 
Father God, I would ask that as we jump into this book of 1 Thessalonians, that we richly are, are renewed in our faith and our love and our hope, that we see how you have given us these precious gifts, that, that you have d- done the work of, of faith, hope, and love in us, and that we are at this place of response to it, that you are calling us to love our brothers and our sisters, uh, be a light in our neighborhoods for you. And so challenge us, God. Challenge us to continue to see how you are working your faith out in our life and how we can respond to it in faith. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.